representative mechanisms. Uh, Joan White, our second panelist, was planning to provide some information on Vermont, but she is under the weather this morning. So we're going to go ahead and split this into two parts. We'll hear from Grace Ralph on the latest PIM related developments in Hawaii, uh, along with some background on how they were developed. Um, and then at this time, we're tentatively scheduling Joan White to discuss Vermont on December 8th. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, we'd ask that you please go ahead and mute your lines, uh, send along any questions um, in the Q&A. As a reminder, this is being recorded, uh, aside from the closed discussion that will follow after the Q&A. Uh, we were planning on a, about an hour and a half today, but we're going to cut that back to uh, just one hour with, with one presenter. Um, with that, let me go ahead and provide a um, some background on our uh, speaker today, Grace Ralph. Uh, she joined the Hawaii Public Utility Commission in 2020 as a senior utility analyst. She contributes to the performance-based regulation, distributed energy resources policies, and integrated grid planning efforts, among other things. Uh, previously, she worked at the American Council for an energy efficient economy, focusing on utility sector energy efficiency programs and policies. She holds a degree in energy and environmental policy from Columbia University and the University of Delaware. In her free time, Grace enjoys playing ultimate frisbee and running with her dog. So Commissioner Anthony, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you with any other opening remarks, and then we'll go ahead and, and let Grace share her presentation. Oh, thanks, Elliot, and welcome everyone. Um, you're at a meeting of the Performance Based Regulation Working Group. Um, I'm the chair of this group, and I'm really looking forward to Grace is going to tell us about some of her, some of the performance incentives that the Hawaii PUC has adopted in the last few years. Um, she presented us with a list of about 10 different performance incentives that the commission has adopted. and. Um, Joan and I gave uh, our thoughts on what we were most interested in hearing about, and I hope that those are the same mechanisms that you will also find interesting. Um, so um, I'm going to let Grace describe the performance incentive mechanisms um, that, uh, that she wants to feature, and I'll have some questions, and then I really, really hope that you all um, ask, you know, jump right in when Grace is done talking and, and ask your own questions and let this be a, you know, we're a small group today. It's, um, so let's let this be a sort of intimate conversation among colleagues. So thanks, Grace. Great, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, well, morning here in Hawaii. I am excited to chat with you all today. And as Commissioner Anthony said, you know, I do hope that you jump in with questions. I are. Our performance-based regulation framework in Hawaii is absolutely rife with acronyms and terminology that I feel steeped in every day. So if I say something that you don't understand or that I haven't fully explained, please just jump in and let me know and I'd be happy to explain further. Um, I'm going to stop your sh screen sharing, Elliot, so I can share my screen. Is that all right? Is that looking all right? Okay, great. Well, I'm going to get started. So um, as I said, my name is Grace, and I'm going to share some information on performance-based regulation and the PIMS here in Hawaii. And um, my goals for this presentation are for you to come away with a better understanding of kind of what Hawaii's goals were for PBR and how that translated into particular PIMS. Um, and then, as Commissioner Anthony noted, I'll talk about a couple of those PIMs just to kind of get the conversation started on how things are going here in terms of utility performance and, um, you know, assessing how the, the framework is working in general. And yeah, and then I would love for you all to ask me a bunch of questions. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the overall framework here in Hawaii, mostly just generally because I think it'll give you a better sense of how the PIMS fit in, and in particular it relates to one of our cost control PIMS a little bit more, um, more closely, and then, and then I'll go into the PIMS uh, more specifically as well. So to develop the PIMS within this framework, I kind of think about categorizing our work into these six steps shown here. 
Um, first was we established our goals and desired outcomes. So what are we really trying to achieve? Then we threw out ideas for PIMS and workshopped them with each other. We had a, a nice working group that would do homework and um, really kind of provide coaching questions to each other to improve our, um, our proposals. Then we formally proposed um, ideas and gathered supporting data and really kind of got into the nitty gritty of like, how would this actually work? Um, then we, the commission issued its decision on the portfolio of PIMS. Um, we finalized the details and tariffs and got the PIMS into place. And now we're in a period of like assessing the PIMS and adjusting as necessary. And it's kind of, now we're actually in the performance period for the PIMS. So the move to PBR was actually legislatively mandated in Hawaii. So um, Commissioner Anthony had asked me kind of how we got the utility on board with this. And I think because of the legislation, the utility was pretty inherently on board with the effort. But I will say that um, Hawaii invested really significant time and effort up front to align on what the desired goals and outcomes were for the framework. And in my opinion, this uh, investment really paid off when we ultimately started designing the mechanisms. There was a really strong foundation to fall back on of what are we trying to achieve. Um, that happened over a year long stakeholder engagement process or maybe even a little over a year. And um, ultimately we landed on the guiding goals and outcomes that you can see on this slide, which we classified as either existing under the traditional regulation or those that are still emerging. Um, and once we had identified those outcomes, we kind of narrowed in more focusedly, uh, focused in a more focused way on where performance is not adequately addressed by the utilities underlying structural incentives of the current traditional um, regulatory framework. And then we, um, and, and those that were not adequately addressed kind of we decided were ripe for developing PIMS so we could target better performance in those area areas. So the resulting framework, I will summarize here. Um, broadly, the framework includes revenue mechanisms, performance mechanisms, um, a pilot process for innovation, and safeguards for unexpected circumstances. So um, currently, the revenue mechanisms represent the bulk of the utilities um, revenues. Over the next five years, the utilities revenues are capped under a formula that's indexed externally to inflation and a couple of other factors. Um, and then there are some additional areas where revenues are outside of this revenue, uh, revenue mechanism. So I'll talk about those a little bit more in the cost control performance area. Um, but I really just, I, I want this to be kind of a takeaway because most of the utilities revenues are here covered under this like annual revenue adjustments or the ARA. That's kind of their um, key operating revenue on an annual basis. Performance mechanisms are kind of the other bulk uh, part of the framework overall. And these are where we identified the opportunity for additional rewards above that formula. Um, the framework includes five new PIMs, or it started out with five new PIMs, um, and opportunities to earn rewards for future projects on a case-by-case -case basis. And then this is kind of the transparency aspect of the framework as well, where we've asked the utility to report on a bunch of metrics over the, the five-year period that will help us kind of track and assess their performance. Um, the pilot process is intended to allow the companies to quickly pursue innovative projects that align with the PBR objectives. And then finally, the framework includes safeguards to ensure that neither the utility nor customers are facing kind of outsized impacts if achievement is too far in any direction. So if they over earn or under earn, um, and also the commission can always review anything um, if it looks, looks off. Okay, so here's a bit more detail on the framework's five new PIMs. Um, these were actually in addition to two existing PIMs, one for reliability, kind of a safety safety PIM, and one for uh, customer, uh, customer service based on call center performance. So the first is an acceleration of the renewable portfolio standard. 
Basically, if the companies can bring renewable energy online quickly, they can earn rewards. And there's also a penalty for this one, um, but it's it was mandated by statute. And this is one of the, the areas that I'll go into in a little bit more detail. The second PIM encourages the companies to acquire grid services from DERs. This is intended to help maximize the value of resources that are already on our system and then to bring more DERs online to help the companies gain experience with using those resources um, as a meaningful grid resource. There's an interconnection approval pin that encourages faster interconnection of DERs. Um, the next one is intended to incent collaboration between HECO and our energy efficiency administrator to help them deliver energy savings for low income customers. We call this the LMI energy efficiency pin. And um, this pin actually recognizes that many of the pins that we have in place kind of place a necessary emphasis on DERs, but that those might not be accessible to everyone. So this PIM aims to facilitate kind of a more equitable transition and more equitable participation from customers in the energy transition. And then finally, th there's a PIM for usage of the company's advanced metering infrastructure, AMI. And this PIM is intended to help the companies prepare to maximize the benefits of their planned AMI investments and really deliver benefits to company to customers. So those were kind of the first five that we developed as part of the, the, the PBR framework. Um, and a, about a year following, or maybe, yeah, about a year following the initial onset of the PBR framework and it really taking effect, the commissioners identified that there was really lagging performance in a couple of other areas. And they asked our working group to come together to develop new PIMs on five areas of concern that they had identified. So those are shown on this slide. Um, the first was cost control. So noting that there, there may be non, there's not a lot of incentive to reduce costs kind of beyond that additional allowance that the utility is given every year. Um, the second was grid services, just noting that the existing PIM kind of incentivizes acquisition, but not necessarily utilization of those resources as effectively. The third was a focus on grid scale interconnection. So we're really bringing grid scale projects online more quickly and at lower cost. And then mm -hmm. the last two were generation reliability. So improving, um, reducing generation based outages. And then finally, more timely retirement of fossil fuel generation. So um, reducing delays in those. Um, and the last the last column here shows what the result of that effort was. The first area we resulted, uh, we ended on a collective shared savings mechanism. So we call that the CSSM, and I'll talk more about that. Um, for grid services, rather than implementing another PIM, we asked the utility to develop a functional integration plan and, and continue work for kind of evolving that PIM over time. We did land on two new PIMs, one to reduce interconnection study times, and one that modified our existing reliability to PIM to include generation outages. And then finally, we asked the utility to develop a comprehensive fossil fuel retirement plan. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a bit of a deeper dive into three of the PIMs that I mentioned, the first of which is the RPSA PIM. Um, that's shorthand for Accelerated Renewable Portfolio Standard. Uh, this PIM was widely supported by stakeholders in our PBR working group. And ultimately it became the largest component of the PIM portfolio, meaning it's expected to provide the companies with the largest, um, the largest portion of their rewards. And you can see those listed here. So for 2021 and 2022, the rewards are $20 a megawatt hour above the RPS for any megawatt hours above the RPS. Um, and then that reduces to 15 and $10 a megawatt hour of the remainder of the RPS term. Um, the rewards are increased in those earlier years to incentivize even faster achievement of the RPS which is aligned with a number of fossil fuel retirements here in Hawaii and a time period of tight energy reserves. And um, the numbers that you see there were supported by a benefit cost analysis that 
considered reduced carbon emissions, customer bill risk reduction, um, and they wanted to look at resilience as well, but that didn't end up being quantified in the BCA. So as I mentioned, stakeholders are really enthusiastic about this and basically noted that they believe that this PIM supports every one of the PBR outcomes that were identified. And, um, and so because of this, when the time came to develop the second round of PIMs that I just spoke about, some stakeholders proposed that maybe new PIMs weren't even necessary and we could just really juice the RPSA PIM, hit that button, increase RPSA, et cetera. This is a meme that my, my colleague made, so I just thought it was fun to include. But we did not end up juicing the RPSA incentive. It just, um, it, but it continues to exist at, in its current state. Great. Can, before you move on, can you, yeah. um, can you just, what does customer bill risk reduction benefit um, mean to you? It's a good question. So my understanding of the way that it was included in the benefit cost analysis is that, um, it was a, an accounting of reduced risk from reduced volatility on customer bills. So noting that fuel prices in Hawaii are a straight pass through to customers and those tend to be quite volatile, whereas our renewable um, grid scale projects tend to be on a kind of fixed cost PPA basis. So my understanding is it was a quantification of the reduced risk in volatility in customer bills. I think my colleague Dave is on as well as Commissioner Asuncion if they have anything to add there. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, it does, thank you. Um, so the other PIM I wanted to talk more about was the Advanced Metering Infrastructure PIM. Um, Commissioner Asuncion and I kind of discussed this at the, uh, just briefly at the last meeting, um, but this PIM provides a reward for customers that have AMI that are delivering at least two of the three identified benefits of AMI. Of course, there are many benefits of AMI, but um, we went through a process to determine kind of where are the areas that we really see the utility needs to maximize performance in order to deliver benefits to customers, and where were they maybe not already planning to, um, to provide those benefits. So we wanted to provide a reward for something they weren't already going to do, and so we identified new areas of benefits. The first of it, which was author authorization to share data with third parties via Green Button Connect. The second was enrollment in receiving energy usage alerts. And the third was enrollment in next generation DER or time of use programs. Um, and this provided a this provides a potential reward between one and $2 million annually for meeting the following targets. So in 2021, if the utility had between two and a half or 5% of all of their customers that had AMI and were delivering at least two of the identified benefits, they could earn a reward. Um, and that increased, that percentage increased pretty rapidly over the next two years, just um, aligned with the rapid pace of their AMI rollout. So that's kind of the structure of that PIM and I'll, I'll come back to the performance on it, but just wanted to kind of lay that, that groundwork there. Finally, the third one I wanted to note was the Collective Shared Savings Mechanism, the CSSM. Um, this was to incentivize improved cost control over costs that are not covered by that annual allowance that I mentioned. So anything under the allowance or covered by the allowance, if the utility is able to reduce their cost, they can keep that as a reward. But for costs above that, they don't have that same incentive. So this mechanism kind of tries to emulate that for um, costs above the allowance. The metrics and targets are for savings compared to a base year amount of costs for fuel, purchase power, and then any exceptional projects that cost recovery has been approved by the commission. Um, and adjustments to that base amount are made to account for fuel prices, inflation, and the total amount of system generation. So kind of macro indicators of um, costs that might change. And if the utilities can bring down those costs, they can keep 20% of those savings and then 80% of the savings are returned to customers. 
So this one is, is pretty brand new. It just was implemented this summer. So we don't have a lot of performance on this yet, but um, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, and so last, I just wanted to mention a couple of notes on performance. In 2021, the RPSA PIM, the companies achieved 31.5% RPS um, on a consolidated basis. So this was above the, the mandated RPS um, and they recorded a reward of just over a million dollars for that in 2021. For the AMI PIM, however, the companies requested modifications to the PIM design and they just they noted a number of challenges to implementing those benefits that we had identified. Um, one, COVID-19 had sort of slowed their AMI rollout and they also had challenges in sort of connecting with customers um, and had a number of priority messages that maybe weren't energy usage alerts or customer sharing, that kind of thing. And so they requested modification to the target denominator and also to the benefits that are included in the PIM. And I just think it's interesting here, they, they provided this table to justify the, um, the need for changes to the PIM, showing that they have basically 0% of customers that are providing at least two of the benefits of this PIM. So that is an open question for us. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about kind of considerations there, but um, we are still trying to figure out as a team how best to systematically review and update PIMS and kind of when and how to do that um, to ensure that one, there is stability in the PIMS and that the utility knows what to expect, but two, that we can also adapt to challenges that we're facing and make sure that the, um, the PIMS are effective. So I'll just close there and um, thank you for your time.